Welcome back to 25 Minute Physiology. I'm Dr. Andy Galpin. Today we're talking carbs, fat, and protein. Now, most people, unless they're on a specialized diet, most people are going to have some sort of a reasonable split between the amount of protein, fat, and carbohydrate that they ingest throughout the day. Now, depending on your situation, you might change the proportions of some of these, and we'll get into those in later videos. But what's important to talk about today is, let's say you decided on some ratio, whatever that ratio happens to be. How do you actually go about integrating that into your diet? So in order to understand that a little bit better, I think it's important we cover three topics today. Number one, we need to talk about the molecular or uh, chemical structure of these components. From there, we can then talk about their actual function once we understand their structure. And then we'll wrap up today's video by giving you some actual application to show you how you can implement some of those things so you have the ability to maybe decide on your own proportions, experiment with that a little bit, change them up and see how you feel so you can be your own nutritionist. To understand what's going on here, we need to understand the relationship that each macronutrient has to our body. In other words, what role is it actually providing when we consume it? Well, to start off, carbohydrates and fat are fairly interchangeable because their basic function is to provide with us with, with cellular and metabolic energy. Protein, on the other hand, while it can provide energy, is really meant to be structure. So a quick way to think about this is a silly little analogy I'll have here. Let's assume we're out camping and we need to make a fire. If I take newspaper and if I take wood, I'm going to make an easy fire. These are going to be the fuel for fire. Okay. Now, if we look at the chemical structure, which we'll get into in just a second, what we realize is that carbohydrate, or the newspaper in this rule, is a string of carbons. Fat is also a string of carbons, but a longer stream. So anyone that's made a campfire will know that uh, a newspaper will give you maybe a few minutes of fire, but it's going to burn out really quickly, where wood or a log is going to give you a lot more energy over the long term, but the drawback is it's going to be harder to ignite. Right. Well, it turns out the chemical structure of wood is a longer chain of carbon, kind of. Right? And so what we have here is paper being made from wood, right? and these both being fuels for fire. So when we consume carbohydrate or fat, we're using that to produce us energy. And that's why we can see high-fat diets or, or high-carbohydrate diets, low-fat diets, and people can function even in sporting contexts pretty well with both because they're fairly interchangeable. Where they differ quite considerably is protein. Now, protein is like metal. All right, now, I could, in theory, if I waited long enough, melt this metal plate here down, and I could get a fire out of it. You can burn metal. You're just not going to get very, product, very high production value out of it. All right, so protein is generally not meant to be used for fuel to power energy. However, it's meant to be used as structure to build things on. So if I took my newspaper and my log here, and I lit it on fire, and I melted down some metal, I could reform it and shape it into the function I wanted to make something usable. So let's talk a little bit more detail about the structure as we head back into the garage. The reason carbohydrate and fat is so interchangeable is because of their molecular structure. Now to back up just a second, everything in this universe is made because we've got several, if not well, trillions of atoms combined together, connected through things called bonds. So really all a chemical is, or a molecule is, or what separates it one from another, is what atoms are in it and what kind of bonds it has. Now, if we look at carbohydrate, what we realize is carbohydrate in its most simple form, all right, so when it's floating around your body in the form of glucose, it is a one, two, three, four, five, six carbon bond. And if you're not familiar with carbon, that's what makes life. All right, that's what the field of organic chemistry is, is the study of carbon. If you have carbon, you are, are considered to be alive. Right? And so glucose being, or, or sugar in that matter, and for the record, sugar, carbohydrate, glucose, it's essentially the same word, right? A little, little um, extra bonus knowledge here. Carbohydrate and sugar is roughly the same word. Now, not all sugar, or excuse me, all sugar is a carbohydrate, but not all carbohydrates are sugar. For example, fiber, right? Fiber is a, carbohyd is a carbohydrate. That's not a sugar. Anyways, our most basic form and fundamental form of energy is this six carbon chain, right? So with all of our bonds in between it. So if you've seen the 25 minute or the 55 minute physiology of fat loss videos, we talked about how we derive energy from the breaking of those molecular bonds. 
Well, if we look now, when we step back and we look at the storage form of fat, right? So in our body, we tend to, st to store fat in our adipose tissue or our subcutaneous fat, and we call that a triglyceride. OK, now what that actually is, I missed a couple of bonds there, don't tell. Um, a triglyceride is also a extensively long chains of carbon. And why it's called a triglyceride, is tri meaning three, is because it is a one, two, three carbon backbone. We call that glycerol, by the way. And at the, at the end of each glycerol backbone is a free fatty acid. Right? So this is a free fatty acid, free fatty acid. We'll talk much more about these in separate videos. Right? In fact, this is what makes unsaturated or polyunsaturated fats is whether or not this is a double bond or a or a single bond, right, things like that. Now, the length of the carbon chain of each fatty acid depends, or that's actually what determines its type. So different types of oils or different types of fats have different amounts of carbon. But this entire molecule, again, would be one triglyceride. And so what we can see is when we compare that to a carbohydrate, we see some significant differences and significant single, uh, similarities. Well, significant difference is the fact that look how many more total carbons exist and one molecule of fat. And if you remember, we get energy from the breaking of one bond. So what we see here is we have an excessive or exponentially more amounts of bonds that we can break with the one molecule of fat than we can one molecule of carbohydrate. So we're going to get exceptionally more energy from breaking down this entire molecule. We'll get roughly the same amount of energy per bond broken, but we've just got so many more bonds we can break. All right. Now, the similarity is the fact that they're molecularly almost identical. And so it's very easy for our body to kind of go back and forth here. Right? I can easily break down a fat and generate a glucose molecule if I need it. By the inverse, I can add a bunch of these together and form a bunch of fat if I have to. And so again, this is why when we mentioned earlier, it is possible for people to go on low carbohydrate diets if they have extremely high fat diets and have enough energy, right? Because their conversion back in there is fast. In fact, this is the point. This is the, the physiological point of these molecules is this is supposed to be your acute form of energy, and this is your backup storage, right? So if we use a silly analogy, this is your gas tank in your car, and these are, this is, all of the tubs of gasoline you have out back just in case. Right? This is your backup generator. What we're trying to do with, with our diet and our normal human evolution is to make sure that we have an equal balance here because we want to have some excess fat around to power store, to power, uh, to give us backup power. But if we consume too much of either one of these macronutrients and we have too much backup, we don't like that, right? Uh, obesity has got an enormous health risk plus the aesthetic component. But this is what it's for. So we have to stop thinking about fat and carbohydrate as opposing issues and think about them synergistically. They're meant to work together. It's not bad to have fat. It's not bad to have carbohydrate. This is also why people tend to say things like, if you eat too many carbs, they'll be stored as fat, which is true. The same thing happens when you eat too much fat. Right? Eating too much makes you fat, not eating too much fat. So we have this molecular exchangeability between fat and carbohydrate. We'll talk more detail about stuff later, but we have to understand the basic component all right, of our carbs looking like that, our fat looking like this. Protein, though, as we mentioned with our uh, weight plate analogy, is very, very, very different. When you break down protein, you're not going to have excess amounts of carbon available. What you're going to have is a bunch of amino acids. And you've all heard this, right? Amino acids are the building blocks of protein. This is really what we're talking about. So in your body, when you break down protein, you're going to break it down into a bunch of different amino acids. Inverse, if you want to build a protein, you have to combine together a bunch of amino acids to make a protein. We can go through a process where we can break these things down, get a couple of carbons, and, and convert those into a little fat or into a little carbohydrate for some energy. But as we mentioned, Outside, we don't want to. We want to keep these as structure, but we want to be able to have a full exchange back and forth here. This is an important concept similar to what some folks will call metabolic flexibility. 
In other words, you have a physiological capacity to swing back and forth between burning fat and carbohydrate as a fuel source based on your very specific needs so that you can optimize performance, energy, and aesthetics. So if we try to put this into practice, this is what it would look like. Now I want to cover a couple of common mistakes to build on what we talked about with the structure and function. So go ahead and come in and take a look at this first plate. Now let's assume we're back to the original pie chart out in the, in the garage where we talked about maybe you have an equal third, one third, one third split between fat or carbo sorry, protein, fat, and carbohydrate. All right, so uh, vegetables, fruit, all carbohydrate. I know there's some fat in here, particularly in this delicious skin, but let's just assume this is all protein, this is fat, and this is all carbohydrate. Okay, now what most people are going to make the mistake of thinking is I want, again, we'll just go with one third, one third, one third to make this concept easy to understand. And so they'll think I want one third, one third, one third, so I will fill my plate with one third, one third, one third. Easy enough, right? Well, the major mistake with that is we have to realize per gram of protein, we get about four calories. Per gram of carbohydrate, we also get about four calories. But per gram of fat, we get nine calories. So when it comes to being actually on your plate, a split like this would not be one third, one third, one third, because even though it is per size, you get over double the amount of calories from here. So what we're actually looking like per calorie is more close to a 50% fat, 25% protein, 25% carbohydrate. So it's critical that we understand this. If we go ahead and look at plate number two, we see, okay, we've made an adjustment. We've reduced, in fact, I'll bring it back in. We've reduced our fat intake in terms of the amount on our plate by about half. So what this means, one third grams carbohydrate, one third grams of protein, half of that amount of grams of fat to give me one third calories carbohydrate, one third calories fat, one third calories protein. But mistake number two is understanding which foods are dense in which macronutrient. So you can't just simply build your plate like this without a greater understanding. For example, we see a big, nice, delicious hunk of chicken like that. We can actually pretty quickly calculate the amount of grams and then we would multiply that by four to get the amount of calories that we're getting from protein. But not all food sources are equal. So a great example of this is our two carbohydrate sources. Okay. What we have to realize is even though our carbohydrates within category amount is about the same, so we have about the same amount of size of our cherries as we have of our vegetables, we don't have nearly the caloric density in vegetables in this particular vegetable source that we do this fruit source. And so what we'd actually end up happening here is some of our food sources, and this is true for fat and, and protein too, by the way, some of our food sources are more or less dense per volume of size on our plate. And so again, even though this looked better than our first attempt, because we fixed the calorie issue, we screwed up the volume issue. Vegetables are particularly good. One of the many, many, many reasons why we're told to eat them you know, until we can't eat anymore is because they occupy a big volume, but they have very, very little actual caloric density. Meaning there's probably, uh, what, uh, Tatasha, what do you think? How many calories is literally in this little bit of salad? Five. Five? Ten calories? I don't know how many calories are in these cherries, but it's probably triple, quadruple that. That's not to say cherries are bad, and very clearly, fruit is not bad for you. Fruit does not make you fat, right? Everything makes you fat if you eat too much of it. But it is a lot more calorically dense, but it's good for you too, right? There are a lot of micronutrients, phytochemicals, and other things that are super important in fruit as well. Right, so to make our picture a little bit better, assuming we want to do that one-third fat, one-third carbohydrate, one-third protein, a more accurate plate is maybe something more like this. Okay, uh, let's assume that's the same amount of chicken as before. I know this one's a little bit smaller, but say we get, you know, 25, 30 grams of protein right here. So let's go with 25 to make the math easy. If I multiply 25 by 4 because of, you know, grams per kcal, that means I'm getting about 100, gram, 100 calories of my meal coming from protein. So if I wanted to go a third, a third, a third, that means this entire plate needs to be about 300 calories. Okay, 
Since the calories per gram is double in fat, that means I have to have half the grams. And so if this was 25 grams, we'll call this maybe something like 12 or 10 grams. When I multiply 10 grams by 9 calories per gram, I get 90 calories. And so I've got about 100 calories from protein, about 90 calories from fat. And if I want to get 100 more calories of carbohydrate to give me my, my third, my third, my third split, my volume on my plate of this of carbohydrate source particularly, the volume needs to be excessive in order for me to get 100 actual calories or 25 grams of carbohydrate. Okay, so this is confusing and frustrating a lot because people don't necessarily realize this, particularly the fat issue. So people can tend to overeat fat, not that saying eating a lot of fat is bad for you, it's phenomenal, but if we're not anticipating it being that much, we can overshoot our, our, our rough caloric intake by hundreds or thousands of calories um, per day, which can be a problem if we're really focused on trying to make a weight or we're, we're trying to restrict calories or increase them for some reason. So by the inverse of that, or the opposite of that, fat is a one way to help yourself add calories if you're in that boat where you're trying to add excessive caloric intake. You can add a bunch of nuts or some avocado or some, some wonderful olive oil or something like this, and we could pour this onto our food, add a lot of calories and almost no volume. So hopefully that helps you understand a little bit about what the fats, protein, and carbohydrates are actually doing in your body. You, I guess you can start calling me the Alton Brown of physiology. Right? <laughs> Natasha <laughs> just rolled her eyes really heavy right there. Um, so check it out. Uh, some more of the videos if you like. Share them. Pass them along to all your friends so we can help get all this information out to people who want it and are going to use it. You can support me at the website, andygalpin.com. Um, any questions or feedback, get me on social. I'll be there. Thanks a lot.